do is I'll just read uh, President Reagan's uh, values, freedom, faith, family, uh, dignity of human life, American exceptionalism, the founders, wisdom and vision, lower taxes, limited government, peace through strength, anti-communism, belief in the individual, this last point here is really a bonus that helps to help people get along is a wonderful sense of humor. <laughs> Did you like that, Claudia? <laughs> I did very much because I've got my honey jack sitting right next to me and I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> kind of loosens up the tongue a little bit, doesn't it? <laughs> So do you have your guest on? Is Michelle on with us too? I am. Michelle. There she is. Hi, Michelle. Hello. And I want to ask you, and are you in New York City somewhere, or where are you? Uh, no, actually, uh, I am located in New Braunfels, Texas. Oh. Okay. I think that's just north of Austin, or in between Austin and San Antonio, isn't it? That is correct. It's the hole in the donut. It's the hole in the donut. donut. That beautiful black prairie area of Texas. Well, yes. I think that's the beginning of... Do I have this right, Michelle? Is that like the hill country? It's the beginning of the hill country. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's pretty down there. They have the... It is. It's very pretty. There's a river that goes flowing through there where it's pretty interesting, like a white water type of river. Is that river... Still in action? Does it, does it have... I imagine it's pretty full with all the rain that you've had down here. Oh, it just flooded out this weekend, yes. That's the, uh, the, uh, the Colmau and the Guadalupe Rivers. They uh, just flooded out this weekend with all the rain. Wow. Well... <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me on today. Um, I really don't know uh, what to start. I guess I should give you a little background about myself. Um, on, I was uh, assigned to the New York City Police Department on 9-11. I was a, a sergeant, and uh, it was Election Day. Uh, I always think that's uh, very ironic because we were, as citizens in New York City, we were going to the polls to elect the mayor or uh, the primary uh, to find out who was going to be the mayor uh, to run in the general election. And because uh, normally I wouldn't work that early in the morning. Uh, but because it was election day, uh, there was a, a detail where we had to have a lot of cops on uh, standby. And I think it's just ironic that we get attacked by people who uh, just hate our way of life and our freedom and liberty on the very day that we're going to the polls to exercise one of the rights that we hold dear in this country. Wow. Well democracy at its finest, and that's the day we were attacked. Okay, let me... And let, I don't know if everybody couple, knows that, but that's the case. But I don't... I didn't remember that. I don't know if Jeff did or not. Oh, this, yeah, sure did. Okay, yeah. so this is Rudy Giuliani. No, Rudy was going to be leaving office. This election was going to be electing his successor. Correct. Yeah. Okay, but, the, but he was, wouldn't have taken office for a few days after that, or months after that, right? Uh, actually, not until the, not until January. Okay. Right. So, all right, I've got my bearings. So it was just, uh, like I said, otherwise I wouldn't be working that early in the morning. Uh, but because of Election Day, I was at, at work. Uh, so we uh, got word that a plane hit the World Trade Center. And it was a beautiful, bright, sunny day, unseasonably warm. And we didn't really think anything of it other than, okay, uh, it was, you know, a, an emergency. Uh, so I was a sergeant, and I went down with uh, eight police officers to the World Trade Center. Uh, I was supposed to go to church in Vesey Street in Manhattan. That was our mobilization point. And on the way down, we're talking in our van about how we couldn't believe that this just happened. That is, the pilot must have had a heart attack, uh, something must have gone wrong with the plane. 
and terrorism didn't even enter into our thought process. Uh, we pull up uh, to about City Hall Park and uh, a female lieutenant comes in and she says that she needs me and my cops for our van to start evacuating people. And then uh, right then we saw a giant fireball, which is the second plane. Uh, you didn't see, I didn't see the plane go through, but all I saw was the giant fireball. And I know everybody says it's like in the movies. It's like you were watching a movie. Uh, an incredible fireball that just lit up the sky. Um, and at that point, uh, we did, started just evacuating people, and everybody was just running. Uh, so I had some of my people go to evacu evacuate the subway underneath City Hall. And all these people are running to you, and people are running to you, and they're trying to give you children. Just take my baby. Just take my baby. Other people are running across the Brooklyn Bridge, and all that's going through my mind at the time is, oh my God, that's another target. I, the Brooklyn Bridge is an iconic symbol, it's, it's, an, it's another target, but it, you can't stop all these people running across the bridge. And, uh, and then also at that point, uh, a man comes up to us and he's covered in blood, and all I remember him telling me is, Please don't help me. Uh, please help me. I don't have any diseases. And I just found that so strange. Apparently he was a, um, uh, a man that had some experience with uh, working volunteer EMS. And he wanted us to know that he didn't have any communicable diseases. Uh, and he was fortunate because one of my cops, uh, Officer Randy Consiglio, she was also uh, an EMS. Uh, was EMS, Emergency Medical uh, Services, before she became a police officer. And uh, she looked at him, and all I could see at the back of his head was covered in blood. And I said, oh, he's got a bad head wound. And she said, that's not his, that's the least of his problems. She says he has got an artery severed in his arm. Uh, so she's taking care of him. Uh, other people are running, trying to give us children. I have other people evacuating the subway. At this point, it's just, just complete chaos. It's you train for everything. You train for, um, you train for shootings. You train for gas explosions. You train for blackouts. You never train for a terrorist attack. And at this point, uh, we. Uh, this gentleman, his name was Gary Johnson, uh, an ambulance came and uh, my cop at least was able to triage him and put him in an ambulance. And then at this point we're still trying to evacuate people and then Tower One collapses. And all you see is, you can't really see, you hear it. Because at this point, all it is is a giant dust cloud that just comes right towards you when you're caught in it. And you can see. You can't see, but you can hear. And it's deafening, and people are screaming and crying. Um, but you really can't see, so it's frightening. Um, and at this point, no one knows what's going on. Uh, but... We were completely covered. Everything was covered in dust. And uh, the, yeah, we couldn't believe that the towers collapsed. I mean, you can watch it go down. They just, just were almost like building blocks, just, just straight down. And then the clouds went out, it dispersed out. And then we were caught in that. And then at this point, uh, it was absolute chaos. I mean, you could hear on the radio, fire, the firemen were trapped in the building. Uh, I could hear a female police officer, she's trapped, that was uh, Officer Moira Smith, and she's calling for help. And at this point, when you, as a cop, hear another cop or rescue worker calling for help, and you can't do anything, it is 
the most horrible feeling. You just you, you feel so useless, so helpless, because you really can't do anything. Um, and at this point, uh, we were we regrouped, and it was just complete chaos. People running, trying to get other people out of the building, getting people out as quickly as possible. Uh, myself and my people, we were sent over to uh, Broadway, right behind City Hall, to set up a triage station and wait for uh, victims. And uh, we waited for victims basically all night, and it became uh, pretty clear that we weren't uh, going to have any uh, victims. Uh, we were there probably till midnight, and we did not have a single victim. And it's all you could the smell of the smoke, and your eyes were burning, you're coughing. Uh, you still have to maintain some type of control, or you try to control the situation and keep people out of the frozen zone, which was very difficult to do because people wanted to come in to help and you had uh, you didn't know who to let in who not to let in it was just complete chaos until probably much much later on that night and we had an idea of what happened um, but I had uh, you couldn't breathe you couldn't see and all you could keep doing was coughing and trying to um, get all the, the dirt and the dust off of your face so you can, you know, tr try to maintain some type of uh, cohesion and some order. But it was pretty depressing uh, when we're waiting for victims and we didn't have anybody. And then at that point you felt absolutely useless because um, you wanted to be uh, at the, you wanted to be at the World Trade Center. You wanted to try to help get people out, but your job is to uh, take care of victims, and unfortunately, there weren't any. And um, that was that was that very first day, and then. Um, I went down, I think, two days two days later, and we were a bit, we were a lot more organized. But I mean, it looked like Lower Manhattan looked like a war zone. It looked like uh, all I remember is there was a new hotel, and it hadn't even really opened yet. And all I saw was uh, when you walked around, windows blown out, cars toppled, cars thrown all over the place. Everything covered in dust. Uh, walking through downtown, uh, the ground was so hot. Uh, the smell, the smell you came, you can still remember the smell to this day. The smell, um, everything was covered in dust. I mean, cars were covered in dust. There was so much debris all over the place. Uh, part of the uh, the wheel of the airplane, and you could see all of the debris everywhere, and just ab absolutely incredible. It was just complete, complete devastation. From a city that was looked brand shiny new that morning, and then that night and two days later, Lower Manhattan was in shambles. You know, here you are, you're right down within, sounds like, just feet of what's known as being Ground Zero, where the, where the two uh, towers stood. Uh, I don't know how far City Hall is from the towers. You'll have to help me with that, but you're right there. Uh, you're, you're a few blocks here, a few blocks away, but we were supposed to go right to Church and Vesey, which we would have been there had we not been... Uh, 
relocated by a, uh, a female lieutenant that wanted some people evacuated. So uh, we would have been right there had we not been commandeered uh, to do some other type of duties. Well, the, I mean, faith, faith comes in lots of different ways, doesn't it, with people? It, it's, it's Absolutely. The, the, the impact, though, of what happened, I mean, that's what I'm trying to communicate to the listeners from where the tower stood relative to where the impact zone is. You know, when you go out blocks away and still windows are blown out, that is, that takes a lot of force. That. Oh, you're, yes. And human beings. Well, the death toll was flying down those streets. You know, so all those businesses, you know, they for blocks on end were destroyed. Right up to our city hall, they were all getting just covered with the dust. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that you saw the dust cloud come towards you. It's, it's like a, a fog, but with a much heavier motion. Um, it, it's like a reverse mushroom cloud? Yes, that's actually a very good description of it. it, it, it it's impact to where it, you know, it was going from the top down, and then it bellows out. So, out, yes. And it, it really, it's from the center of the action, which is where the World Trade Centers are, then you... It, from that center point, then the, in order for it to release its power, it has to just push out. And who knows how far that radius would be from the center of that action. And all of those buildings, and it, more importantly, the individuals in that zone were, lack of better words, contaminated. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. Well, the current geographic location that's been um, established for those in the, um, we'll call it the fallout area, go all the way up to Canal Street, which is a mile and a half, actually, from the World Trade Center. So if you were to look at a map and you just drew the whole uh, street down across Canal Street, you can see the devastation all the way from there down to Battery Park. And that's all considered part of the geographic fallout zone. So that's uh, roughly 7,500 feet, 7,600 feet is how far that is, um, and, and, and that's, that is a lot of, uh, you know, when you take the radius, what is that pi r squared, Jeff, how many square miles is a one and a half mile radius? That's uh, probably like three square miles or so, roughly, so that's, that's a long ways. Okay, so the people are the ones that we're concerned about here and the long-term effect of all this, Michelle. Um, I mean, many people died without a doubt. Many people got hurt, but when they, somehow or another, they made their way, so there were people hurt, but they somehow didn't come to where your station was located or your... Um, uh, Our triage area, correct. Right. So, so they... They just got away from there, it sounded like. But Well, and when we ran into Gary Johnson, it was just, it's just, I guess, the shock of it, and he just had the sense to just go north and, you know, uh, find the first uh, first person that he, that he saw that maybe could help him. Uh, but it was things like that. People were coming up to people having trouble breathing. Uh, People were, uh, the people were cut, I mean, those type of injuries, you saw those people, they just wanted to get away from, uh, the, uh, from away from the World Trade Center. But uh, those people were, and they were, a lot of those people weren't even in the Trade Center, they just uh, had their injuries from the debris. It's things flying around, and I mean, I can remember... Of course, you know, I've seen videos and seen information on uh, Claudia's website. You know, you the, the amount of dust that's, uh, that was bellowing through that area, I mean, it was super thick. And all that's contaminated. And uh, so 
get us into the area where you witnessed over time, you know, the effects of people that were in that zone or worked in that zone after 9-11? Oh, well, um, I went down with eight police officers and uh, all of us, myself included, all of us have uh, World Trade Center related uh, illnesses and three of my eight cops have cancer. Three of the eight? Yes. What are their symptoms? Uh, one, uh, uh, one woman has breast cancer. I have uh, somebody else that has uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And um, I have somebody else with uh, a lung cancer. Okay. And Claudia, of course, you know, we've been on with her a couple of times now, and she has shared that she has the... Uh, the 9-11 dust cough. Is that what you're calling it, Claudia? Yeah, it's uh, known as the World Trade Center cough. The World Trade Center. And a lot of us have that uh, first few months because well, that site that. was burning for months afterwards. Right. Not only that, I mean, everybody, immediately when you went back to the station house uh, and when you took off all your, uh, your uniform, and I just threw my enamel. Uh, when you were coughing up, I, and you were coughing up with, with pieces of debris. When you would blow your nose, you would uh, also, when, in your tissue, you would get pieces of debris. I mean, so you inhaled this, you ingested it, um, it was in your eyes. I know people that, uh, right then and there, people just delayed going to the hospital because they wanted to help everybody get out, but we had people that were rinsing their eyes out with water, uh, people that had some, you know, little, some uh, minor uh, burns just from the heat, because jet, uh, you know, there's benzene and jet fuel, and jet fuel burns very hot, so, uh, I mean, there were people down there, I mean, there was, I had cops that they would go through uh, uh, police work boots. Every, every two or three days because uh, the soles would just get uh, worn out from being on the, on, the heat, on, the, on the heat on the pile. They were literally melting off the soles of the shoes. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, and we did not have any type of protection, I mean, especially that first, the first couple of days we had no protection at all. <laughs> so we were breathing everything in. You know, I guess, when, you know, Rudy Giuliani, to me, was a pretty good mayor. I mean, he, uh, I like him. I don't know if you liked him or not, uh, Michelle. Can you give me a... No, he was a good mayor. I was going to say that, you know, with the, your cause that you're trying to do is you're trying to get these two bills passed, the Senate and the House bill, which we'll give those numbers here in a few minutes, and uh, to where these people that were exposed to 9-11 contaminants, um, you know, will get some attention uh, from doctors, and we talked to the lady that we talked to last night, last week, uh, her husband passed away uh, here not too long ago, and she's left with a pile of bills from her husband being the amazing American that he uh, was, going down and, and uh, working on the, uh, the uh, on site and providing oversight with the pile itself, <laughs> and uh, and then he gets sick and has been sick for a long time and stacked up a bunch of medical bills for his uh, for his wife to pay, and you know and that's when that's even with what's the official bill called Claudia that's that has funded up for medical care up until well, this point in time. Yeah. The original bill, which already has overwhelming support, a filibuster-proof um, majority in the Senate to pass it. I got the official numbers today from a very reliable um, official resource. We have 62 in the Senate right now to pass S-928. Now, on the House side, the bill number is H.R. 1786. 
Uh, the official number as of today is 241. You know, we only needed 218 to pass this bill. But here's the problem. Uh, uh, Representative Goldblatt, who serves on the House Judiciary Committee, came out with a new bill um, uh, called H.R. 3858 just a few days ago. And this is wreaking havoc with everything that we're trying to accomplish. And absolutely unnecessary. To come out with something like this on the 11th hour, not having shared it with the other politicians who've been so very much involved with this. And then he came out with H.R. 3858. But there's a lot of problems with this bill. Uh, and I can go into more detail on that. But there's also, on the other side of this, uh, that H.R. 3858 affects especially our compensation funds. There's also a, there's no bill actually written, but there is a draft that came out from the Energy and Commerce Committee to extend the health program, which we need desperately, which already expired October 1st, for only five years. And it provides less funding than the, the bills that are already currently overwhelmingly supported. So I don't understand where the politicking comes in. I don't like politics. I, I never wanted to be a politician, told my son don't ever be a politician. <laughs> You know, and so then I see this stuff, and they're, they're playing with our lives. And I, I have to wonder just how much real empathy and understanding they have for what people like Michelle, what Jackie's husband went through, what over 1,800 responders, 1,800 have died because of 9-11. So 9-11, like I say over and over, didn't end on 9-11. We lost 2,977 people on 9-11, and that's from all three attack sites. That it's at Shanksville, Pentagon, and the World Trade Center, 2977. We're already over 1,800 who were also murdered that day, who just took longer to die. And then we've got 70,000 that are sick. We've got 33,000 in the, in the health program, and they're trying to cut our funds. And they want us to go back and beg for money every five years. How ridiculous. You know, there's precedent that's been set. When we talk about things like the uh, federal black loan program, we're not asking for anything that hasn't already been done for others. Well, and we're, we're different in that the um, uh, one of the things that Goodlad has uh, introduced with this new bill of his is to um, uh, reauthorize us, however, also, um, uh, I'm trying to think of exact wording here, um, the victims of state-sponsored terrorists. Well, we're all for anybody who's been a victim, which I hate that word, as you already know, a casualty of state sponsored terrorism. That's all great and good, and we can go ahead and take from the French bill and the bank and do all of these wonderful, marvelous things that they have in mind. But this bill that he's proposing and conjoining that cause to ours is nonsense. There is no real comparison because we continue to get sick. And we're going to continue to get sick. Over 4,100 right now have cancer. 4,100 people. And that's just now. The latency period for mesothelioma due to our exposure to the asbestos that was in those buildings. Just And I'm just talking the World Trade Center here. That's going to come back and start biting us here very soon. And we're going to see those numbers astronomically increase. So to cut the funding and, and to do what, what is being proposed here is hurting all of us. Go ahead, Michelle. And there are also other illnesses that haven't uh, yet been included into the World Trade Center um, uh, covered. They're not uh, so far certified by the World Trade Center. I mean, there are people that have illnesses to uh, that have eye illness that have uh, illnesses related to uh, autoimmune diseases. There are people that have uh, issues with their eyes. That, that has not been covered yet under the World and Trade an entire, Center. And there's an entire process that the CDC, NIOSH, who oversees our programs, their health program, goes through in order to certify these conditions. And as a matter of fact, think of, think of some of this. Our, our original Zadroga bill was passed back in 2010, late 2010, December of 2010. It was actually signed into law in January of 2011. Two years later, we added cancers. So now we've got cancers added to this. Certainly the funding wasn't provided for back in 2010. We need to provide for that now. And we need to provide for all these people that are going to be coming down with cancers and all these other illnesses in these next 10, 20 years. 
And that's what we were looking for, and that's what has overwhelming support. And the CDC and NIOSH has been um, uh, meticulous. And we don't always agree with them, but we also know that they continue to look at some of the items that Michelle mentioned. Things like the eye problems, the autoimmune disorders, and kidney diseases. There's other things, heart diseases, that are coming about that they are looking at to certify or not certify. Some of these conditions have already been denied, but that is not to say that they won't continue based off of scientific research and data specific to those people that were exposed in moving forward and possibly covering those in the future. So there's a, a wide... We need the funding for uh, that type of research to go on. And a lot of the research is done through um, a variety of different sources. Mount Sinai, there's other colleges and different resources that are tapping in and providing a lot of this research through even their own funding and grants. Well, but they I provide the information well, as well as NIOSH and CDC are doing their own. I would like to comment on that. And Jeff and I talked about it, uh, I think it was on Tuesday and Wednesday. You know, when you ask the question that you hate politics, you don't like politics, okay? Well, the, 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 the solution, unfortunately, it, it, it does fall on politics. And politicians themselves, not all of them, but a good many of them, you know, they're self-promoters and they care about themselves ultimately, number one. Some of them do some great work, without a doubt. Without a doubt. And we certainly don't want to... Uh, say that it's across the board, that politicians are self-serving. They, they want to know where the money is before they'll talk to you. And this is not only in the federal government, but it's also in many of the state governments and even in local politics. So, Oh, without a doubt. Uh, senator John Cornyn is my senator, and myself and a bunch of other first responders who live in Texas we're going up to his office to speak with his regional director in regards to support of the, dro the droga bill this month. Because it's about educating know, politicians. If we want them to know it's not just a New York issue. We live all over the country. And we live, we relocated to Texas because of illnesses, because it's, uh, if we would have better air quality here. And, uh, and we have a, a steady climate, so we want we want to educate our our politicians, our local politicians, that they need to support the bill and support us. So how did that go? We can't just be a photo op. We can't just be a photo op on the anniversary every year. Right, it's got to be. Something. And this big part of our advocacy of our group is education. And that includes the politicians. So I can hate politics. Doesn't mean I hate politicians. Just means that we need to educate them on exactly what we're going through, so that they do understand, so that they have that sense of empathy, not sympathy. We're, nobody here's looking for a pity party. You know, we went down there, we did the right thing, and and we need them to understand that we're sick because of it. Yeah, and I and I hate to get well. I don't hate because part of part of all of this stuff, ladies, is and this is my humble opinion is that in order for your, my personal opinion, anytime our military or any of our uh, folks that put themselves out there for the national security of this country, I mean, those people need to be taken care of. And it needs to be right. There can't be, uh, I mean, everything has to have a budget. Unfortunately, if the budget is blown, then there has to be an approach for money, but it needs to be streamlined. There can't, you, you have to watch out for if, if, there isn't some kind of an accounting that is providing some kind of oversight, then unfortunately there's waste. And, uh, you know, but you got to have the right people involved that knows how to deal with uh, uh, keeping the culture positive, but also hold people accountable. So it takes very good managers. If you look at what's going on with our, uh, our VA hospitals, there's many doctors and people that work in, within the VA system are probably very good, but unfortunately, there's some issues. And uh, the only way to straighten things out is that you gotta you gotta take the people out of the system that are self-promoters 
and good people in that are truly good managers so that the customer, which are, which are our military, in your case, the people that provided, uh, you know, uh, oversight and assistance and support and love for 9-11 victims in that community there. So, uh, and I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of fiscal conservancy. There's uh, it's been too much government waste on a lot of programs that we don't need, on a lot of um, uh, pork that goes out there and that we're, we're um, throwing away our money on items that don't matter. Yeah, and they could have funded this And yet here we've got issues like our veterans. Yeah. And 9-11 responders are veterans. You, you know, but we don't have a VA, like I've mentioned before. And, you know, when we look at it, the, the little bit that we're asking for, you know, we're talking about $5 billion, there's another $900 million that may be added to it. And I'm reading from the um, CBO report from back in 2010 on the money that was, was expected to be needed for years right up through 2020. And I've looked over those figures, and I've looked at what we're asking for and what's been approved, or I shouldn't say approved, but um, uh, overwhelmingly supported uh, by the two bills that are currently exist. You know, I read an article just the other day, and this blew me out of the water. For Halloween, this country spent $7 billion. One day, one holiday, $7 billion. We're asking for less than that to take care of, like, sick and dying people. I call that fiscal responsibility. Yeah, I mean... And we owe fiscal responsibility to our VA, to our veterans who have served this country and have lost so much. God bless them all. And and with us, too. Yeah, they, You know, like I, I mentioned earlier, there's our president's already been sent with, uh, sent with black lung disease, you know, and, and we're not asking really for anything other than... And, and, I, think that's, kind of, uh, and I think that's where we can agree upon, you know, when... Politics, unfortunately, is where money's being spent that has no value to those that keep our country secure. 